so that there is no uh, uh, noise. Please mute uh, all of you. Pankaj uh, Tupsundar, please uh, uh, mute your mic. Thank you. Uh, and now I uh, uh, we begin this uh, uh, program. Good morning again, Namaskar, and uh, welcome all. The vision that Hindu youth uh, should become strong and proficient in modern warfare was the life goal of our, the founder of Bosla Military School, Dr. Balakrishna Shivram Munji. Dr. Munji was not merely uh, an expert ophthalmologist. He was a freedom fighter, a social reformer, and a pioneer in military education in India. In this quest, he strived hard, traveled the world, and garnered knowledge and help and support. He visited military schools in Germany, Italy, and other countries, and also met uh, in the uh, on the same subject. He met Mussolini. Finally, uh, in 1936, at the age of 64, he established Bhusra Military School in Nashi. On the 12th of December. 2021, that, that is just a few months ago, the 150th birth, birth anniversary year, year of our visionary founder has started. In this year-long celebration, the Central Hindu Military Education Society, CHMAS, is publishing a booklet on various aspects of Dr. Munje on the 12th of every month. We have already published a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of uh, booklets, and today is yet another step in the same progression. Today, in continuation of this process, with Lieutenant General D.B. Shekhatkar, President of CHMA Society, presiding over the ceremony, we are very pleased to announce the release of a booklet by eminent authors Akshay Zog and Nitin Gokhale at the hands of Dr. D.G. Belgaukar, uh, General Secretary, CHMA Society, CMA Hemant Deshpande, Secretary, Nashik Division, CHMA Society, and Captain Dr. S.G. Narone, retired, Director Kamri and Chairman, Nashik Division, CHMA Society. I request the dignitaries to present uh, who are present at the Bosla Bhavan to release uh, the booklet. Over to uh, Bosla Bhavan. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the book is now released. Could you hold it up, sir, uh, for, a, for, a, for the photograph? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'll uh, come back to the authors of uh, uh, the contributors of this booklet. I can see. Uh, 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 People are coming in, so I, I welcome everybody who is joining. Mr. Akshay Zog, uh, who has contributed to this uh, booklet, he's an electronics engineer, basically, but more importantly, he's an expert on life and uh, times of and contributions of Swatantra Veer uh, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. His first book, Swatantra Savarkar, Swatantra Veer Savarkar, Akshay Pani Vastav. That is, in Marat, uh, that is in Marathi, of course, and it means uh, objections and reality. This book was so well received that it saw 11 reprints in two years. He further wrote two more books uh, uh, on the same, similar subject line, Swatantra Vir Savarkar Parichit Ani Aparichit, and Swatantra Vir Savarkar Anchi Kathit Kshamapatre, Akshay Ani Vastra. Both were equally popular. Mr. Akshay Zog writes regularly for many uh, periodicals, appears on various TV channels for debates and panel discussions, and travels the country giving lectures uh, on Savarkar, Hindutva, and Rashtravad, all the subjects which are very close to his heart. As the booklet upon Prakashit Kela, the Chatya Pustakama, the Tani, Hindu Dharma Shastratla, so like Shuddhi Karya Vishay, the Vivechan, the Tia Gushi, where the Tani Adi. Uh, uh, and he should say a few things. He has four or five minutes uh, to speak about his uh, contribution. Thank you. Uh, over to Mr. Akshay. Sir.
Mr. Zhou. Thank you. Namaskar. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunity and selecting me to write on this subject. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bhai Pushra Shivodha Munje, uh, founder of the Boska Military School and very staunch uh, supporter of Savarkar's militarization policy. Dr. Uh, Dr. Vashi Munje, Hinsa Vaishishtha Sir, राजुर्लक्षित महत्वपूर्ण डॉक्टर मुंजेक्टिवेटी लीडिंग स्ट्रैटेजिक अफेयर्स एनालिस्ट एंड 
author of half over half a dozen books so far on military history, insurgencies and wars. He is also a very well known YouTuber, uh, if I may add. And uh, he's much popular among uh, all the YouTube uh, viewers regarding the subject. Starting his career in journalism in 1983, he has since led teams of journalists across media platforms. Specialists, a uh, specialist in conflict coverage, Mokhle has covered the insurgencies in India's Northeast, 1999, Kargil conflict and Sri Lanka's Ilam War, both between uh, 2006 and uh, 2009. Mr. Gokhale now travels across the globe to speak at uh, seminars and conferences and lecture at India's premier defense colleges. He has founded two niche portals, BharatChakti.in and StratNewsGlobal.com. Global, uh, we have all heard him on the YouTube. Now let's listen to him in person regarding uh, uh, the, the article that he has written in this booklet, Dr. Munje, a renowned strategist. So let's hear about this life of this piety soul. I request him to say a few words on this subject. Mr. Nitin. Thank you, <clears throat> Vinay Kulkarniji. Namaskar. Good morning to everyone. Uh, I happen to be in Pune, so right now I'm not in Delhi, which is a good thing because uh, there's some time to you know join this uh, uh, function, uh, which is happening uh, online, uh, fortunately. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to make it to Nashik. Uh, General Shekhatkar, uh, all the uh, seniors here, all the dignitaries, and all the participants. It's a great pleasure uh, with which I'm uh, speaking here. It was uh, indeed uh, a very... Uh, enlightening for me to uh, write this booklet uh, because um, this booklet is a follow-up on uh, uh, the uh, history of a uh, Bhosla military school uh, Nagpur branch which I wrote uh, three years ago and uh, during that um, writing of that uh, particular book I actually came across uh, Dr. Munje's uh, stellar work and his uh, thought process uh, in the years uh, between the two world wars World War One and World War Two. And uh, realized that uh, there were uh, visionaries uh, like him uh, who thought um, much ahead of their times. Uh, they uh, knew that uh, eventually India will have to have uh, hard power. Uh, and uh, for that, they will require uh, well-trained military uh, leaders, uh, military uh, personnel. And uh, therefore, uh, when he started uh, speaking in the uh, Legislative Assembly, of which he became a member in, I think, 20, 1927, uh, he actually took up uh, the indigenization of the military training that the British were carrying out under the King's uh, Commission uh, in Sandhurst, where there were uh, 10 odd uh, Indian officers who had the seats uh, reserved for them. But he wanted a larger number of Indian officers to be trained as military personnel. And uh, therefore, um, he, as a disciple of uh, Bar Gangadhar Tirap, uh, wanted uh, them to become uh, military leaders, revolutionaries, and not uh, just uh, non-violent, peaceful um, agitationists, uh, which were the two schools of thought uh, which were jostling with each other at that point in time. Uh, in fact, uh, he went to South Africa when the uh, war was on there, and that influenced his uh, thinking uh, uh, quite substantially from uh, what I could do, which I have actually tried to bring out uh, during uh, in the uh, booklet itself and uh, when he was participating in the debates he realized that uh, there was a lack of uh, martial spirit amongst uh, the, the countrymen and uh, they were sort of uh, told that uh, being uh, aggressive being uh, um, you know uh, uh, proponents of hard power will not be uh, good for india because that will provoke the british uh, that really distressed him so he actually moved a resolution in the assembly uh, saying that uh, military training for schools and colleges must be made compulsory. Uh, this was in 1928. He was a very uh, ardent student of Mahabharata and uh, uh, Kautilya's Arthashastra, which uh, influenced him. And uh, going forward, he thought uh, if the colonial rule had to be ended, then uh, military subjects have to be taught strategy, tactics, uh, and uh, both Kutniti and uh, Arthaniti need to be brought into uh, the, uh, the syllabus of uh, military schools or military training. And therefore, uh, he moved a resolution saying indigenization of the army uh, should be uh, brought in. So he moved a resolution in the assembly in which read, and I quote, This assembly recommends to the governor general in council that as a beginning in the direction of preparing India for self-defense, 
immediate steps be taken to bring about the indigenization of half the cadre of officers in the indian army and to carry out the unanimous recommendation of the skin commission with regard to the establishment of the indian sandhurst and the recruitment of indian officers in these arms of the defense forces paid for out of indian revenue from which they are presently excluded unquote this is what uh, actually spurred the british to establish the indian military academy in um, in dehradun and uh, which is in dehradun now and uh, that uh, was the beginning of uh, what uh, what we call uh, formal military training in india so we owe uh, a debt of gratitude as well as uh, a great contribution from uh, dr munje uh, for uh, what the indian army or the indian military is today because uh, that's where the uh, first course of indian officers began in 1932 and uh, you would be pleased to know and uh, that uh, the uh, some of them actually went on to become chiefs of other armies uh, besides india i mean general manik shaw became on field marshal later field marshal manik shaw became of course the legend that he is but there were two others uh, with him who also went on to become uh, one became the chief of the pakistani army general musa khan and then uh, uh, general dun uh, became the uh, army chief of myanmar at that time burma so uh, dr munje's contribution therefore not just in terms of training but creating a thought process uh, sort of uh, creating a new thought process i would say that uh, military training uh, for college and school students is a must if we have to regain our lost glory and uh, not get overwhelmed by colonial forces uh, i think is everlasting and therefore i was very pleased and uh, i am grateful to uh, the organizers and the uh, and the um, lead uh, leaders of uh, bosna military school and the central military hindu society for giving me this opportunity that's all i wanted to say and thank you very much once again for this opportunity have a great day ahead thank you very much sir uh, uh, your your knowledge and your expertise on the subject is very well known and uh, your words are going to enlighten many of us here now uh, from this subject of release of this uh, important booklet let us move on to uh, the next uh, uh, main program the chme society's bosna military college and kanuji angre maritime research institute kanuji is organizing uh, a webinar on budget 2022 for defense ministry and defense industry in collaboration with the department of uh, civics and politics center for excellence in maritime studies cmas the university of mumbai now this is a very important uh, discussion and we are very very fortunate to see four preeminent personalities who occupy top notch positions in their chosen fields of economics and defense will be coming together to discuss this important topic Yeah, Dr. Ajit Ranade, uh, Air Marshal Anil Chopra, uh, uh, Mr. Mukesh Bhutani, and uh, Commander uh, Suchin uh, Jain are so important people that uh, it's not my place to speak a few words. I will uh, I'll request uh, um, uh, Brigadier Hamid Mahajan uh, to uh, speak a, a few words about them first up and introduce them. Uh, but before that, I will introduce uh, Brigadier Hamid Mahajan. he is a much decorated uh, uh, soldier uh, an active soldier who fought uh, valiantly on the uh, in kashmir and uh, he was part of the uh, maratha light uh, infantry infantry the 7th maratha light infantry and he even commanded the battalion uh, he, he is an msc uh, an mphil in defense and uh, uh, and since his retirement he has uh, completely devoted himself to uh, the uh, uh, defense uh, uh, writing and has written in top notch newspapers in english marathi and hindi and published more than 4000 articles in last 12 years alone he regularly appears on tvs and he has write, uh, written multiple books uh, and is a well known authority on the subject so i i i hand over the uh, reins of this program to uh, brigadier mahajan uh, to conduct and moderate this panel discussion involving these four personalities over to you sir Uh, okay uh, thank you vinay ji for your kind introduction uh, firstly i take this opportunity to thank uh, bosla military school uh, uh, bhme society and everybody for giving me an opportunity uh, to be a moderator in this particular session uh, the occasion today is very important today we are at uh, 150th birth anniversary of the founder president 
Dr. B.S. Bunje, uh, uh, whose uh, anniversary we are celebrating. Uh, Nitin Gokhale uh, before me spoke about Dr. Munje, and I would not like to repeat anything, but I would like to add that the military training that was given to the Indians uh, before independence, before 1947, ensured that we had a trained leadership available when India became independent in 1947. The 47-48 war went on for nearly one year. And those of you who, uh, who have studied it would realize that first six months, nothing happened simply because both sides' commanders were Britishers. The Indian leadership of General Thimaya, General Kariyappa came nearly six months later. And that is when the whole uh, procedure of carrying out offensive operations against Pakistan started. So this leadership carried us through the war of 1947-48 and Kashmir became a part of India. Uh, afterwards, in 65 also, the same leadership was there. And uh, not to mention the 1971 war where Field Marshal led a uh, led our armed forces to a brilliant victory, uh, a lightning campaign. And again, all these people were uh, battle hardened in the Second World War. So that was the contribution of participating. And Dr. Munje uh, uh, Sadhguru Sabarkar were few leaders who were ahead of their times and who said the Indians must join the British military because that time joining the British military was considered not considered good because Britishers were enemies. But they said no. Today, the Britishers catch you even if you carry one pistol and if they want to teach you about rifles and light machine guns and uh, aircrafts and uh, ships and all, this is good. This knowledge is going to be useful because military knowledge, military experience takes a long time to gain. And how right he was was proved by our victories in 47 war, 65 war, and of course, 71 war. So that is so much for Dr. Munje and his foresight and the kind of a uh, 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 thought leadership that he gave and he established this great institution which has produced a large number of very eminent students in the uh, in various branches of the Indian military. Now I'll come down to my topic. Uh, the topic today is uh, budget 2022 for defense ministry and defense industry. Uh, uh, this budget uh, uh, was uh, given on 1st of February and uh, I heard the budget completely because for nearly 13 years since my retirement, I'm listening to all the budgets very carefully because the regional channel expect me to give some words of wisdom after the budget is over, especially with, relate, with relation to the defense uh, uh, defense budget. So I heard it, and this was uh, one of the shortest budget, one hour, 30 minutes, and there was hardly any mention. On an average, I counted that in the 13th budget that I heard, average time given to the defense budget varied between 1.30 minutes to two, uh, 2 minutes. Maximum was 2.01 minutes, I think in 2015, if you are statistically minded, that is. But this time, it was even lesser than that. And it takes a fair amount of time later to find out as to what was allotted to the budget. You have to go to the site, you have to go to the defense ministry, wait for the release, etc. Uh, and when people come out, you know, uh, people don't even know what are they talking about, you know, because no statistical data is available. Because at the end of the day, when you talk about defense budget, you must know what was the increase in the budget as compared to last year, what are the budgeted estimate, what are the revised estimate, how much has been allotted uh, to the capital budget, how much has been allotted to the revenue budget, is the revenue budget sufficient, is the capital budget sufficient, uh, how does it compare, how does it compare with respect to the uh, uh, national budget that we have. These are the questions that we need to ask if you look at it statistically. Of course, there is one aspect of statistics, which I'm sure uh, the speakers after me, especially uh, Marshal Chopra will talk about it. And the union budget as such, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Ajit Ranadi will talk about it. And then there are two other speakers who are there. One is uh, Commander of uh, uh, Charter Accountant and uh, Advocate Mukesh Bhutani. Uh, who will talk about the legal aspect, who will talk about other aspects. Then you have uh, Commander uh, Suchit Jain, who is the Innovator Entrepreneur X Program Director for Innovations in Defense Excellence. He will talk about those aspects, you know. And uh, last, of course, we have Dr. Uh, General Shekatkar, uh, who will uh, give his uh, closing remarks on, on, on this whole issue. And uh, uh, before I uh, uh, introduce the speaker to you, today morning only, I uh, got a, uh, I saw the news that Based on the General Shekatkar Committee report, the Ministry of Defense has decided to do away with 9,000 posts of the MES. I repeat, 9,000 posts of MES. Of course, this was recommended by General Shekatkar 
we had it two two and a half years back, but uh, nevertheless it has been accepted now. So that was a very gladdening news that some efforts are on to reduce our revenue expenditure, which at times is unnecessary. And the second part, which was not very pleasing to my mind, was uh, we have ordered the corporatization of the ordinance at the board because defence industry today is a part of it, and these. People, the civilian employees have gone to the Madras High Court saying nothing doing. This. They have given some cock and bull story, if I use the unparliamentary word, you know, to say as to why this corporatization should be stopped. I only hope uh, that uh, the judiciary, who at times has a habit of going for an overreach and poking their nose into uh, uh, subjects which should not concern them, uh, uh, you know, follow a balanced path and give some balanced judgment. Let's hope. Uh, uh, for the best purely from the point of view of our defense budget. So uh, defense budget is what we are going to talk about. And the, uh, what uh, the order of speaking will be that uh, we will speak for uh, Dr. Ajit Ranade will speak first and he's going to speak about the general aspects of the Indian budget and how defense budget forms a part of it. Then you have Air Marshal Chopra who obviously will talk about the defense budget. Then third speaker will be Chartered Accountant and Advocate Mukesh Bhutani who will speak on the other aspects. Then you have Commander Sachin Jain, uh, Suchin Jain, if I pronounce the name, name correctly, he will spoke, uh, speak about the innovations, the defense industries. Innovations has to be there. You know, unless you talk of innovations, things are not going to work. And I'll only contribute uh, one thing here. You know, just two days back, uh, Nitin Gokhale is here. He was interviewing the GOCMC of the Army Training Command uh, on his channel. And there he mentioned, he said every year 130 to 140 Officers of the army do M tech and, and some of them are extremely bright. So now they're thinking uh, they are being sent now to foreign universities to improve the technological quotient of the Indian Army. Then he talked about the academic uh, 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 relationship that must exist between the military and the academic world because there are brilliant people in academic world. And before I could uh, even complete my sentence, today I found the news. Uh, in fact, I got it on our Maratha Regimental Center net that the uh, Army Training Command has already signed a memorandum of understanding with Rashtriya Raksha University. I repeat the word, Rashtriya Raksha University. Today it is being uh, commanded by one of the officers from a regiment to which I belong, Maratha Regiment General, Lieutenant General Mistri is commanding, commanding this regiment, commanding this uh, Rashtriya Raksha University, which is expected to be a premier uh, defense university uh, it is doing a good job, and I'm sure it will continue to do a better job in the uh, days to come. So here we are. Uh, there's a lot of uh, efforts are being done to not only uh, improve the defense budget, but to improve it qualitatively also. Now, uh, what I will do now is uh, I'll come down to the first speaker and introduce him, and then I'll request him to take over from me. Uh, each of the speakers is requested to speak for about 10 to uh, 15 minutes, uh, 15 minutes being the upper time. And uh, after the first speaker is finished, I'll uh, thank the speaker and then introduce the next speaker and the third speaker and the fourth speaker. And after all the speakers are finished, then we will have a session uh, open for question and answers. We'll, uh, we'll take a few selected questions. And I have already requested the faculty of Bosla to put those questions in the chat box, you know, uh, because otherwise, if you give an opportunity to speak, they at times uh, steal the thunder from the speakers, which I would not like to happen, you know. Uh, so uh, let them put their questions in the chat box. Uh, so here I uh, uh, and then of course last uh, General Shikatkar will give his uh, uh, closing remarks on the defense budget and many other aspects. Okay, so I will introduce uh, the first speaker that is uh, Dr. Ajit Ranade. When I look at his uh, biodata, what immensely pleases me is he. I think he belongs to the world of T20 cricket matches. You know, in 20 overs you must say whatever you want to say. His uh, uh, biodata is precisely six lines. I wonder how can a person ever give his biodata in six lines. But I think he must be believing in the theory that a speaker is best understood by the way he speaks. Now, nevertheless, whatever is given here, I'll read it out. Uh, Dr. Ajit Radhade is the Vice Chancellor of Gokhla Institute of Politics and Economics in Pune, which is a very renowned institution. His career has spanned both the academic world and the corporate world. I'm very happy about that because even Commander Suchi Jain also uh, is, uh, belongs to a the services also is in the academic world, etc. Uh, then he was a group executive president and chief economist to Ajit Kabirla Group and Indian Multinational, uh, which is there. He is also a founder member of Pune International Center. It's a very active think tank which is based in Pune. And every month or after every 15 days, they have 
some very nice programs on issues related to national security. Dr. Ranade holds a B.Tech in Electronic Engineering from IIT Bombay, another uh, top in, uh, class institution if, uh, of our uh, country, uh, and is also an alumni of IIM, Ahmedabad, you know. Uh, so uh, double battle, uh, I mean, uh, two very important qualifications, and of course, he's received his PhD in economics from the Brown University. So an immensely qualified person to speak about the national budget and the uh, uh, let's say the part of different project uh, in it. Uh, but before we start, I would like to tell you that the, the defense budget, the latest defense budget is today approximately 13% of the national budget. That is one thing I would like to tell you. And uh, over the last five years, the defense budget share has been decreasing as a part of national budget from 17% to 13%. And I think that's a very accurate way of finding out as to uh, uh, how much money you are getting, but uh, comparing it with the GDP somehow doesn't give you accurate figure. So having given these opening remarks, I will now request uh, Dr. Ajit Ranade uh, to start his topic, please. Over to you, Dr. Ajit Ranade. Thank you very much uh, and good morning and namaskar. I hope my audio is uh, okay. Yeah, you are. Uh, thank you for a very kind introduction. And uh, I'm honored and delighted and privileged to be here this morning. Uh, on the occasion of uh, the 150th anniversary for Dr. Munje. Uh, apart from the description that you read out, I would like to add one little uh, tidbit. And I'm also an alumnus of uh, Bosla Military School. But of course, the, it is the summer course. But you know, as people who go to Harvard University, even if they do one month course, they call, they call themselves alumnus. So I hope I can also call myself an alumnus of Bosla Military School. So uh, wonderful to be here today. I'll speak for, and uh, wonderful to see many friends here. Uh, Dr. General, uh, Lieutenant General Shekhatkar, whom I've had the privilege of sharing the dais on a couple of occasions, and Mr. Anil Chopra. And uh, I must say, I'll, I also participate in the, you mentioned Pune International Center. They, as you know, have an annual dialogue, the Pune Dialogues on National Security. Uh, so uh, that uh, also I've been privileged to be part of. So well, I uh, plan to speak for about uh, 15 minutes, as you suggested. And since uh, my primary hat that I wear as an economist, I will try to give some flavor about the budget and then maybe make a few comments on the defense aspect of it. And then during the Q&A and discussion, I'm happy to come back uh, with uh, more, more intervention if necessary. So uh, the budget is an important exercise because not even a single rupee can be spent by the government of India, or for that matter, government of, at the state level, without the consent of the citizen. So that is the sanctity of this budget process. So the what we say the budget is actually a proposal. What the finance minister presents to the Lok Sabha is a proposal. And that proposal has to be approved. But because the typically the, the party, which is, a, which is a, you know, the ruling party, they, they usually have the numbers. So it is not as if the proposal is going to be rejected or modified. So usually when the finance minister presents the proposal, it is taken as the final budget. Rarely there are any changes, very minor changes, unless there is a huge backlash, which happened, let's say, in 1992, when the finance minister had proposed a 50 rupees increase in the price of fertilizer bags, and that had to be rolled back. So sometimes this rollback gets the, you know, care uh, about them. Uh, the, the the finance ministry is called rollback finance ministry, but usually there is no rolling back. So the importance of the proposal is that this is taken as the budget. And the budget preparation are done over several months, if not several years. So increasingly year after year, we find that there is uh, not much, uh, I would say, surprise or uh, you know shock value or surprise value. And that is the way it should be, because the budget uh, presentation is usually just a presentation of the expenditure and revenue that the government of India will do uh, on on various sectors. Now, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Marjan, that uh, you know, what, if you look at what is the government's responsibility, uh, it is of course to uh, uh, provide public goods. Apart from taking care of the uh, poverty, anti-poverty is a big thing that governments do. But law and order and uh, providing public goods like public infrastructure, like airports, roads, uh, and so on. And of course, the defense of the country. So defense is a public good, which is a primary responsibility, uh, main responsibility of the government of India. So therefore, of course, the, there is a significance to seeing how much uh, money has been allocated towards defense. 
and to that extent uh, that's why this uh, discussion is is relevant today but before i go to defense let me just tell you the highlights of the budget so you know the we are coming after almost two years of pandemic and uh, because of the pandemic that put a huge strain extra expenditure for the government of india on uh, pandemic related uh, you know whether it was uh, because of the lockdown there was a huge stoppage of work you know almost i don't know 30 40 50 percent of uh, economy was closed shut down a lot of people lost livelihoods or jobs so income crisis but that income crisis was threatening to become a food crisis food security so the government of india is now has been running for almost 24 months a free food grain scheme the biggest in the world that uh, under the national security national food security act uh, which uh, gives uh, rice wheat or uh, coarse cereal pulses so this uh, has been running for 24 months now and that uh, expenditure because it is uh, it is free rations for the sake of the pandemic uh, the total expenditure on that has been 2.6 uh, lakh crores so far so it's please bear in mind that that is a very important uh, responsibility that the government has been uh, discharging uh, so uh, we are looking at this budget in the in the context of uh, that we are going to be out of the pandemic soon so uh, that is why uh, we should look at it that way that now because of the uh, remarkable uh, fast vaccine rollout in india and of course uh, in many parts of the world and the optimism which is coming out because of the fiscal stimulus the two largest economies in the world china and usa are going to be growing at 5 to 6% they represent 40% of global gdp so that is they are 10 times bigger together so if china usa together grow at 5% that is like india growing at 50% gdp growth rate so that is the huge impact that will have on the world economy and therefore there is optimism and the uh, growth of the world economy also means an, a great export opportunity for india so india's exports this year are actually going to be uh, this fiscal year is uh, are going to reach something like 400 billion dollars which is a 50% or, or sorry 40% increase over last year so that's a that's a that's one of the consequences of the world economy doing well and uh, uh, next year also i think exports will be a major driver of growth so as far as the budget is concerned the broad numbers are as follows that i mean the the context for the budget is that next year is expected to be a high growth year there is some concern about inflation the budget will continue to provide some fiscal support but it will be lower and uh, the, the focus will be to to uh, uh, stimulate growth at a I mean, at, uh, at a faster pace but also job creation because uh, uh, we, that is the, the the surest way of uh, uh, curing, you know, anti-poverty policy is not to give subsidies or doles, but to create jobs which in turn create incomes for households. So that has been the general uh, theme of the budget. I won't go into to, uh, each and every detail, but uh, broadly speaking, uh, the spending proposal has gone up by around 4%, 4.6%. So the size of the budget is, I don't know, something like 39 trillion rupees, 39 lakh crores which is uh, about a 4%, 4.5% increase next year. To, uh, but all that, uh, the good thing is, almost the entire increase in the budget for next year is going to be spent on capital items. That is not revenue items, but items which are in the nature of investment, you know, new capacities, new you know, infrastructure. So to that extent, it is the growth promoting exp expand expansion. And that is seen uh, reflected I think even in the defense budget, as Mr. Mahajan said, that the defense budget is about 13%. So it's five and uh, out of 39 trillion, 5.2 trillion, 5.3 trillion, roughly 5.25 lakh crores is going to defense. And uh, that represents a 10% increase. The overall government of India budget will expand by five, 4%, but defense is expanding 10%. So, so to some extent, so therefore we are seeing a reversal. You know, I think there was a concern that defense as a percentage of government spending or defense as a percentage of India's GDP has been uh, low, has been going down. But at least for next year, incrementally, there is some reversal. And uh, there also, if you look at the capital spending, uh, that is also going up. Uh, capital spending of overall of defense, and that's a good thing because we want to look at the the, the uh, components of defense spending. 
we want it to be much more capital early oriented we want to be uh, we want that to be much more oriented towards modernization we want it to be much more oriented towards getting future ready so uh, that means we have to look at capital spending so i think to that extent it's going up i'm not going to go into the sub components like uh, army navy air force because uh, and so on uh, i think uh, most of you are aware that actually the capital spending allocation that has been given to army is actually a reduction in fact it's uh, it's gone down but that just means that army and uh, uh, sorry navy and air force have got a huge increase huge increase in the capital allocation so i'll leave it at that uh, the other aspect i'd like to say uh, about the again uh, in the context of the budget uh, defense budget is that uh, the continuing worry is that as i said we want the defense to get Uh, enough allocation in terms of uh, resources for modernization capital uh, intensiveness and future readiness but what holds it down is the is the revenue spending and that continues to be a big challenge i i was just seeing that last few years the pension burden is almost uh, you know one fourth 5.25 lakh like crores and 1.25 lakh crores is pension and uh, that Uh, i mean you will be surprised to know that 5 uh, years ago the total pension bill for uh, armed forces was 54000 crores and it reached uh, by 2020 21 it reached 1.3 lakh crores so almost uh, two and a half times so just in 5 years 250% growth 250% growth in uh, pensions this year it's gone down a little bit from 1.3 lakh crores to 1.25 so i think that is a major area i don't know if we'll have time to discuss that and what is the solution for that but there one must agree one must realize that uh, uh, there are certain myths that uh, maybe the civilian defense is eating up uh, civilian pensions are eating up uh, a large portion of the pension burden that is put on the defense uh, budget that is not true it's only 20% that the, the the civilians are paid 20% so 80% of the pensions are going to armed, pers- armed forces personnel and was of course I, i i must admit that the tooth to tail ratio that is the uh, you know the people who are in service armed forces to civilians that ratio can be smaller today it is i think 1 to 1.5 uh, 1 to 1.15 so that means for every 100 uh, armed forces personnel there are 115 civilians and to that extent some some rationalization some reduction is possible uh, but the pension bill is not eaten up by civilians uh, it is a, 80% is going to armed forces and that is something it is being continuously reset as i said in 5 years it went from 54000 crores to 133000 crores 1.3 lakh crores that's one 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 concern and that pen, as, as the pension part of the budget keeps expanding faster in 5 years it expanded by 250% i just said that next year's budget is 10% bigger so typically in 5 years a defense budget will expand by 50% but the pension part expanded by 250% so that is going to crowd out that will definitely crowd out uh, the the room left for capital spending that is the room left for modernization the room for cyber you know the future warfare is as you know is uh, future warfare readiness is not about uh, the conventional means it's cyber and cyber means you need to invest a lot in in cyber security so that is one area of concern the other the other prominent thing that i'd like to mention from this year's budget is the uh, encouragement given to defense psus domestic defense psus uh, and uh, that is i think more than half a dozen uh, so uh, psus have been given uh, funds to to develop domestic capabilities and also the partnership with private sector so under the pli scheme the production linked incentives as well as under partnership with government ppp model that is uh, private sector is coming in and that's a good thing i think we must also uh, i would recommend that we should not only look at becoming uh, self reliant and less dependent on imports as far as defense equipment is concerned but also look at whether there are export markets now you know this is a little uh, you know this is a sensitive area but i'm just saying that uh, i i'm saying this because uh, we should not develop domestic capabilities by raising import tariffs by raising import barriers because that is not the surest way of 
uh, developing competitive uh, edge in technology or in uh, domestic capability. So, the, so long as we keep the barriers low, and so long as at least we if we tap into export markets, that tests how good we are in the global uh, global uh, field, global stage. So that's about it. I think. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, overall, I think the budget was uh, the relief for middle class was there were no new taxes. At least you know this is a non-defense angle, but there were no new taxes and no changes in taxes. The, uh, the, as I said, the positive part is that all the extra spending is going towards capital spending, including in defense. And uh, there were several other initiatives, modern initiatives like using drones in agriculture, uh, much more focus on organic farming, or uh, modern concepts like you know tax on cryptocurrency, uh, then uh, introduction of drone, as, as I said, drone, the, the national policy for electronic vehicle battery swapping, so many such details are there, which are, I think, um, uh, worth noting. Uh, final comment is that because I'm an economist and I, I, my, I think I also look at what is the impact of development. I must say that the long-term security of, of the nation depends on how strong is your human capital. Of course, how strong is your army, navy, air force and defense capability. But ultimately, how strong is your economy? And economic strength comes from the strength of your human capital. That is the brain power, the muscle power, which is basically spending on education and health. And on that front, I, I must say that we are still uh, we have a backlog. We have to uh, catch up with the world average. The, our spending on health and education is still low, and this budget has not done anything to enhance that. Of course, one might say that that is a domain of state government, but uh, be that as it may. One last comment: uh, since uh, last couple of years, after uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about India-China relations. So in that context, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, some of us wrote this book, uh, which which talks a lot about uh, India's economic uh, strength and economic uh, policy. Uh, about, so this is this book I'm going to show on the screen, Mr. Majin, this is my last thing. This is called Rising to the China Challenge. And it has won an award in December. Uh, so I'm happy to say it came out a couple of months ago. Uh, there are six authors, but uh, I would uh, recommend if you can get a, uh, your hands on uh, the book, uh, at least the first chapter describes some of the things I've said. And there's a lot of discussion on defense readiness. So I'll stop here and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Namaskar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ajit Ranade. You have covered a lot of ground and you have uh, uh, covered quite a few points uh, which would have required a, a bit of discussion, but uh, that is presently not in the agenda. However, I'll talk of only two things, you know. One is you talked about the economy recovering. Yes, the moment economy recovers uh, uh, as a whole, then uh, the defense budget also uh, increases. So that, that itself is a good thing to happen. And last two years, we have definitely done well to ensure that the damage to the economy because of this biological war which China has launched against us is kept to minimum. So that was one comment. Secondly, you talked about the revenue budget. And in fact, uh, reducing the revenue budget, of, which is an obvious thing, and no better person to talk about it than General Shekhatkar. He has given, I think, a hundred uh, such recommendations as to what to what what is to be done. But government is uh, possibly not acting upon it. I don't know if the government can be convinced. And I only mention only one thing because that is a subject which General Shekhatkar can talk about. Simple thing: uh, uh, an infantry soldier retired at the age of 35, 36. He lives to the age of about 75, 78. Nearly uh, 40 years, 45 years, he is taking a budget. So simple uh, solution given by the Shekhatkar committee was that you uh, uh, carry out a lateral induction into police, into Central Armed Police Forces, BSF. In fact, BSF, CISF, CRPF, Elsima Suraksha Bal, ITPP will get a tremendously trained manpower, tremendously motivated manpower, and the human element that you are talking about will increase tenfold by just one step. You know, you talked about the human element of the war. You know, yes, it's very, very important. Unfortunately, that is not happening, but I'm sure Something is happening. Uh, yes. Yeah, please. Mr. Bajan, I am uh, really uh, provoked to make one minute interruption, okay. interruption. Sorry for that. But please don't think of these young people who are highly trained, highly disciplined as only people useful for security. I know Shekhatkar community has talked about it. These people will be excellent managers in the business world. Excellent. Human resources, marketing, strategy, production. So these people you mentioned, these 35 year old, 40 year old retired. Don't be only think of them as security guards and BASF and uh, you know they are actually beyond security forces. They are excellent human capital of the country. Thank you. No, what you're saying is right. Okay, 
Uh, now I uh, will uh, move on to the next speaker. Uh, that is, uh, we have Air Marshal Anil Chopra, PVSM, AVSM, uh, VM, and VSM. Uh, he is a qualified uh, test pilot. He is a pioneer in Mirage 2000 fleet, who's commanded a Mirage squadron and an aircraft system testing establishment at the Indian Air Force. He is the leader of the MiG-21 upgrade Bison project, which went on in Russia for nearly four years. He commanded uh, JNK uh, 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 ACS inspection, and he retired as the AOCNC in charge of personnel. Uh, uh, after retirement, he's been very active. Uh, of course, he was a member of Armed Forces Tribunal, etc. But more important, what I look at his qualification now is that he's today heading the uh, Air Force think tank uh, called Air, uh, uh, Air Force think, uh, uh, think Tank, which is a very nice thing to happen because a lot of service personnel with an excellent uh, academic background, excellent operational experience, just uh, retire from life and their vast knowledge which they have gained over the period of time is not utilized for the good of the country. So I'm happy to know that uh, uh, he is not only runs a website on air power in Asia, but he's also a director general of Center for Air Power Studies. A uh, long time back, I've written a few articles uh, for, for this think tank. Uh, so uh, he's heading this think tank since February 21. So he, uh, and not only that, when I was just put his name in Google search, Mr. Google told me uh, that he's written an article on different budget also. So I could read his article. So without any uh, much uh, further this thing, I'll request uh, Air Marshal uh, to, uh, to start uh, his uh, talk. Over to you, Air Marshal Anil Chopra. Thank you, Brigadier Mahajan. I hope I'm being heard. Yeah, uh, you my are. regards to the, the other seniors who are present here and the very renowned people, Javid Chikitkar, sir, uh, and uh, Captain Naravane. Uh, and uh, it was a great, uh, we just heard Ajit Tanade, who's the uh, you know, specialist in his own uh, ways, and he's given us the frame of uh, facts and figures. So I think makes my things easier. Yes, I have in the last two weeks written articles, one each on Indian defense budget and uh, one on the US defense budget because that's important for us to know what the world is all about. So I will cover my uh, uh, little short talk in three parts. I will cover briefly the defense budget which partly has been already covered. I will talk about how the others are spending and uh, what are the influences from uh, to the global world for from the American defense budget. Uh, I must start saying that India is one of the very highly threatened countries, two nuclear neighbors, with both we have boundary disputes and with both we have had wars, and the Western neighbors also the epicenter of the global uh, terror. So with this background in mind, uh, the, we have to look at the defense budget accordingly. Yes, the figures have been given, nearly 10% increase from last year, which is not bad. Uh, it was It is 13.3% of the total. Yes, it has been going down to some extent, but uh, that's okay. I, I, as a defense man, I can tell you it's not bad that there also. We are at the 2.03% of India's GDP, but this includes the uh, pensions. Uh, I must tell you that many countries, including the United States, they do not put the pensions uh, budget or the veterans uh, budget into the uh, you know defense budget. Um, but excluding the defense pensions is what is of interest to us because that is what gets uh, spent on the military. And that is around four uh, lakh crores or fifty-four billion dollars. And why I want to mention dollars because when you compare to the Chinese or the Americans, uh, the figure in dollars will be more relevant. Now, uh, nearly thirty billion out of the fifty-four billion uh, is uh, going into the revenue that is for day-to-day -day running of the armed forces, including salaries, fuel, etc., that and maintenance spares, etc. But the capital outlay, which is going to be directly affecting modernization, uh, which is around 37% uh, uh, of the leftover budget or 28% of the total budget, this is a figure which has been going up. It has gone up even this year by about 12.8%, uh, which is uh, good. And uh, it is increasing much faster than the revenue. That is another very good thing. So the special fact about the uh, capital budget is uh, that this uh, 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 nearly 68 percent of the capital budget will be for acquisitions locally produced uh, weapon systems. So it does give a boost to the indigenous uh, defense production. Another feature is to promote local private uh, defense industry. Uh, that means out of the total R&D budget that has been earmarked, which I'll talk separately, 25 percent of this will go to the academia, startups, and private industry for R&D purposes. So that is another uh, good feature, I thought. 
Uh, yes, pension budget is uh, 15.9 billion, 1.19 lakh crores, which has been earmarked. It is high. It is also because of the pay commission, OROP, longevity, etc., etc. Many things have uh, the reason for this. But when you say uh, we are not talking about how much the defence civilians get, but if you see the pension scales for equivalent ranks in the civil world, um, for IAS or for various other uh, departments. Uh, they are uh, not only comparable, they, they have figures for equivalent uh, numbers of years of service is much higher. So therefore, this is a uh, issue that uh, needs a separate debate. Uh, and uh, it's not what I'm going to uh, speak about. But clearly, the budget is made in India. The major amounts are going to go, uh, you know, to the uh, uh, just LCA for the Air Force, for example, like combat aircraft, the HTT trainer, the Arjun tank, many missiles and weapon systems that are going to be bought. And mind you, uh, a large part of the budget also is going to go away into the committed liability. It means the orders have already been placed, the supplies are already on, and therefore they just to acquire absolutely new things which have not been contracted, the amount will be much, much smaller. Bulk of the revenue budget, of course, goes to Indian Army. It is nearly five uh, times larger than the uh, Air Force and Navy, and therefore it gets nearly five times that much uh, of revenue budget. But because they get such a huge chunk of revenue budget, their total share in capital is less. Their share in capital is also less because uh, the aircraft and some of the weapon systems that the Air Force and Navy have, uh, they have uh, shorter lives, uh, uh, obsolescence uh, sets in much earlier, and therefore uh, you will find that the revenue budget big chunk goes to Indian Army, but the capital budgets are much larger for the, uh, you know, Air Force and Navy. We'll speak a little bit uh, more on this. Border and infrastructure installation security has uh, been given a big jump, 55.6 percent increase, uh, out of which, uh, out of the total uh, budget of 8,050 crores of the border and installation, the border roads the guys get. Uh, uh, 3,500 crores, which is a 40% increase. We are building bridges, tunnels, and roads along the border. So that is very important. Maritime security has also got about 45% increase this time, which is island infrastructure, undermans, coast guards. Coast guard has got another 60% increase. So, you know, see uh, the threat perception of the country, and that is how the allocations have been done. And as well as the ordnance factories, once they became DPSUs, now they have to be given some monies to become modern organizations, self-sustaining subsequently. So they have also got a, a chunk of money, about 1,300 crores. 2,500 crores gone to emergency authorization front, which is okay, which is normal, which is the way it should be. Innovations for defense excellence, IDX. I think so. there is a speaker who is going to subsequently speak about it, gets 60 crores. Uh, and uh, uh, defense uh, testing infrastructure the scheme has been uh, 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 being set up. Some money has been given. Now, this uh, testing infrastructure and for certification, the private sector will be able to use, which is a very big thing. There is a special purpose vehicle uh, which will encourage uh, DRDO to hand over technologies to private players. Mind you, the process has already started in the last uh, uh, few years. So our key takeaway is vocal for local. Yes, that's the term some of the speakers uh, spoke uh, in the parliament. I think the defense minister mentioned uh, the capital budget of IF traditionally gets the highest uh, uh, capital budget. Uh, but this year, uh, the Indian Navy has had a jump of 45 percent vis-a-vis their last year's capital uh, budget. The Indian Air Force also got a jump, smaller jump, but, uh, though it still remains the highest uh, budget remains with the Indian Air Force. But army uh, budget has sort of uh, gone down. The uh, you know there, there are greater details on what goes into aircraft, aero engines, uh, tanks, and various others. Uh, that all has been spelled out in the budget. I will not. I have the figures, but I don't want to mention uh, in so many details. Uh, substantial increase for Indian Navy indicates focus towards Indian Ocean and for the acquisition of ships, aircraft carriers, and submarines. Uh, of course, Army will get uh, more money to spend mainly on their organic uh, systems. They want, they're hardly getting any money for aircraft, but they're getting for main battle tanks and uh, the AK-203 rifles, etc. 
uh, the uh, as i said the ifs capital budget will uh, sub, uh, substantially be committed to liabilities for lca rafal and s400 which we have already purchased and the deliveries are about to complete of course for lca we have to continue to pay uh, for rest of our lives the duty rates uh, uh, mr rahman uh, mentioned has been realigned aligned to make uh, make it uh, better for make in india our industry for long has been saying that our tariffs whether they customs they were not friendly for indian industry so i think the government has listened to the cia and others and they, they made a difference uh, on this okay uh, they, they, of course there are gst changes which have been brought in to support the local manufacture the indigenously designed wealth and manufactured items are now the highest priority that has been there for some uh, years now and uh, increased defense production will also open up avenues for exports and that exports are important for amortizing the cost now it also will generate uh, jobs and support uh, targets of reaching our 5 trillion economy and out of that 5 trillion 25 billion us dollars the best production by 2025 that's the target and i hope uh, that happens the new policies would promote industry uh, and armed forces interaction and coordination and uh, confidence in domestic uh, uh, domestically produced weapons in the high technology areas of course as i said uh, the joint ventures will have been made more attractive more fdi will be able to come in and with this uh, defense manufacturing corridors already in place clearly the tone and tenor of the defense budget has been to make india a defense production hub how it works only time will tell uh, and uh, as i said uh, you know uh, we need to have uh, increase uh, uh, capital uh, budget uh, but i will leave that part to uh, general shakitkar who will speak at the end now let me quickly cover up what is the defense budgets of the other countries now there are two organizations which give us defense budgets of other countries stockholm international peace research institute sipri and the military balance uh, which comes from the international institute for strategic studies but if you take in their figures their figures don't match with each other they don't match with the budgets that we each country announces because every country takes uh, the, uh, every organization takes uh, the budgets in different different forms now in last year us spent 778 billion dollars and china spent 252 billion dollars and india's expenditure total including pension is 72.9 billion dollars so it gives you an idea china is having a budget of three and a half times uh, uh, india closer to four times and uh, america has three times bigger than china so this is the kind of matrix the united states military spending is uh, 3.7 percent of gdp china's is 1.7 percent and india's we already have spoken is 2.1 but there are others like russia which spent 4.3% of gdp and saudi spent 8.4% of gdp so that's the kind of idea to give you of the major countries uh, most of us analysts have been suggesting that it uh, this too we have a modernization gap you know you know indian air force is down from 42 to 31 squadrons and similarly the others army badly need some tanks and hoisters uh, and this so does the navy need Yeah, so we have been suggesting that we should go from 2.03 percent of GDP to around 2.5 percent. I know it's a big call. The country has to spend on education and health, but uh, we have to find ways because we have a backlog of uh, you know uh, modernization. Uh, and as I mentioned, that we are also the most uh, threatened country. Uh, very briefly, let me tell you about how the USA spends uh, their budget. Uh, now, U.S. defense budget not only includes the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines, but also Space Force. the proposals include the defense related expenditure of department of energy you know there are some nuclear uh, programs which also uh, comes into defense budget though they are uh, not outside their uh, uh, ministry so in a little uh, more professional the process is a little more professional uh, you know a team uh, uh, sits down finally the president of uh, america makes a defense uh, budget request for the next fiscal year uh, about 8 months before the due date that means that if, uh, uh, around april may they start because their budget has to be finalized by december and uh, it is looking at the capability building and of course they are taking input from all the stakeholders and thereafter it goes to the senate and mind you this year uh, the, the budget which was announced in december the senate increased the president's proposal by 25 billion dollars they said no you are asking for less uh, because for the threats whether they are in indo pacific whether it's in ukraine whether they have out 
uh, uh, side oversees the contingency operations, whether it's NATO. So the uh, uh, plus there is a uh, requirement for them to modernize the nuclear uh, arsenal, which is as old as in the, of 1960s. The missile defenses need modernization. So and for all this budget, a green book is published uh, uh, when the National Defense Authorization Act is passed, by, uh, cleared by the. This book is 1,300 pages, and it is uh, uh, the budget increase is always uh, bipartisan uh, in that uh, country. So I thought I will uh, just mention that Army, Navy, Air Force, they are, because they are of similar sizes, get to similar budgets. You know, imagine uh, they are getting around 165 billion each. Uh, the Army, Navy, and Air Force, and another 50 billion goes to the uh, Marines. So you know what is the quantum to vis-a-vis uh, you know us. Uh, the, 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 Space Force itself gets uh, equivalent of uh, more than half India's budget. It goes just to Space Force in uh, you know USA. Uh, uh, so uh, and US budget is the equivalent of next 15 countries put together. That means China, India, Russia, Saudi, all these countries put together, 15 of them, the US budget is big. So that is the, the quantum. And of course, for them, the competition with China, modernization with special uh, mention, uh, as I mentioned about the upgrade of nuclear and, uh, you know, they have uh, they have something called Pacific Defense Initiative, for which, uh, uh, which is to uh, look at China threat. Uh, they, they, they give a huge uh, amount over there. For them, the priority of threats is China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and the global uh, terror, and of course, they also have given this year nearly four billion to uh, for Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. So this is how the you know the Americans are spending their um, out of country uh, overseas war fighting is close to sixty nine billion, which is equivalent to India's uh, entire annual budget. Or uh, to that effect, uh, you know, it is uh, that close. So the uh, Average military spending, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the world is around 2.4 percent of GDP. This is the world average. So, and India is uh, uh, below that at 2.1. So, being a very threatened nation, I think we should go at least to the uh, global average of 2.4 percent of GDP, uh, if not, uh, you know, uh, uh, a little more than that. Uh, and um, um, many in the USA think that the threat is exaggerated and it's a narrative run by the defense industry lobby which funds the senators and all their think tanks. So this is one uh, view as far as the public is concerned because they feel uh, that uh, there are uh, so many other things like social security, health, uh, border security, education, infrastructure, which should all be getting more attention than uh, it's going towards uh, to defense. Uh, now, uh, one point I want to mention before I close up, that China's uh, defense uh, uh, budget, there's a large number of expenditures which are going elsewhere but are being for used for defense, like the space program and uh, many other, uh, their cyber, etc. A large number of funds goes to the other uh, ministries. China's total national spend on R&D is $441 billion, $441 billion national out of which 25 billion is defense alone, which is uh, when you look at uh, India's, uh, you know, India's uh, you know, close to a billion dollars, you know. So this is one area I personally feel that we need to invest, uh, spend much more. Uh, on the other side, the Pakistan's uh, official uh, budget is only about 8.8 uh, .8, uh, billion, which is, uh, this year is going to 10.8, and there is a, uh, uh, what the media is telling us is it could be 12 billion. Uh, for the uh, next year. Uh, India has to find ways to increase capital budget. A lot of uh, capital budget goes into committed loyalties. Rollover of the capital budget is now being uh, allowed. More needs to be done on this. Uh, and my last uh, point is that uh, in India, my personal feeling, and I think that's true for all departments, we spend the budgets most inefficiently. First six months, the money is just flowing in. In the later six months, there is a pressure on all have finished budgets in various codes. You know, this is uh, 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 most inefficient. I would rather not use it, but then use it uh, inefficiently because after all, it is uh, India's money. Can we cut down uh, revenue? Can we cut down numbers of the armed forces? Can we make them lean on mean? 
but india depends heavily on armed forces for internal security and hadr missions you know somebody some child falls into well you immediately call indian army so my reputation is uh, despite creating agencies for all them uh, we do more work than ndrf does the armed forces so don't uh, see much changes taking place i don't know how the numbers will reduce but i'm sure uh, general shaketkar uh, uh, will uh, shaketkar will uh, tell us uh, later on thank you i thought uh, i will just make some of these points thank you uh thank you very much air marshal anil chopra you gave a very detailed account uh, detailed analysis of the indian defense budget revenue budget capital budget committed liabilities etc uh, for purely for want of uh, time i will only uh, comment on only one issue that is the improvement in the infrastructure uh, you know if that is the roads and railways and uh, advanced landing grounds and helipads and aircraft now i'll just give you a one example you know in good old days uh, from Pune to go to Guwahati used to take seven days. I repeat, seven days. You know, changing planes at four places. And recently, on an emergency, I went to Guwahati and Shillong, and I reached there in 24 hours from my house in Pune to the place which I wanted to visit in Shillong. 24 hours flat, I was there. What kind of efficiency it used to arm forces? Uh, I mean, you can just imagine. So that is one thing I th thought I'll uh, talk about. And it is improved infrastructure has also resulted. into what uh, the defense minister called as hybrid villages program we don't have time to talk about hybrid villages program but what it simply means is you know having villages on the border because today our border area that have been vacated there's a reverse migration which is taking place from the border areas towards inside and border villages when they are there traditionally the community eyes and ears of our security forces you know and in fact in kargil one would remember that one of the first warnings of the infiltration of the pakistani armies came uh, came from bakarwal who was uh, who were taken as animals there but that program is also started off and uh, the tourism in ladakh has improved so much there are more tourists in ladakh than the population and that itself ensures that a lot of money is put into the hands of the locals uh, thereby increasing their capacity to stay there Uh, I'll now move on to the next speaker. The next speaker uh, today, who is with us, is uh, Shri Mukesh Bhutani, who is a founder and a managing partner of BMR Legal. Is an advocate uh, and a, uh, uh, he heads a law firm also. Uh, his uh, brief by that talks about. international tax market transfer pricing he has over three decades of experience fighting for the foreign direct investment policies business reorganization what i like is expert uh, uh, on many landmark judgments which go to his credit especially with regard to international tax policies controversy and advocacy he is deposed as expert witness on many contentious issues such as cross border tax treaty etc he is a qualified chartered accountant and holds a bachelor's degree in commerce and law he was a practicing advocate uh, before various tribunals and uh, uh, he's uh, the next part is give us uh, give out his uh, achievements he has been consistently been ranked as the leading individual an elite practitioner a litigation star a band one lawyer and a thought leader and he has recently featured in the list of a list of icons among india's top 100 lawyers so really an impressive by data and he is more than qualified to talk on the subject uh, that is uh, uh, this part of the defense <coughs> now over to shri mukesh butani for his presentation shri mukesh uh, thank you very much uh, chairman uh, mahajan uh, distinguished uh, panelists uh, celebrated army personnel on the dais uh, it's a pleasure pleasure privilege and an honor for me uh, to be present uh, uh i think the previous speakers have touched on uh, the budget trends in terms of expenditure i'm not going to talk about that but my objective uh, for the next 10 minutes or so is going to be throw in certain thoughts more as an observer and a budget analyst i do not profess to be a defense budget expert or for that matter defense industry barring some of the large indian and multinationals i have worked in so i'm going to touch on some of the regulatory aspects from a growth standpoint which in my view currently could be impediments for the future of the growth of the defense industry well let's try and look at the one theme of foreign direct investment uh, up until 2001 there was no foreign direct investment permitted in the defense industry so that's the first time india opened up 
with 26% foreign equity. Uh, thereafter, for 13 years, no change took place. Up until 2014, the present government upped the 26% uh, limit to 49% limit. And over and above that 49%, FDI was allowed on what is called on a case-by-case -case basis. The interest of foreign investors uh, have remained low, uh, not just uh, up until uh, 2014 when we upped the FDI limit, but it's largely been low. Based on the feedback that uh, it suggests that the defense industry by its very nature likes full controlling stake and they do not believe that 49% gives them the full controlling stake. Also, the other aspect that has been raised, particularly by multinational, is not so adequate protection of intellectual property. 2020 was a landmark year when we raised the limit to 74%. Uh, we have still to see the results from 2024. If you simply look at the FDI figures, they are not very encouraging. So what does that lead us to? Uh, a growing trend on Make in India, particularly in the last few years. Government's decision to ban import of 101 products in August 2020, including important products like light combat helicopters, short-range surface-to-air missile, cruise missile, are some of the important decisions. As a matter of fact, on light combat helicopters, Prime Minister himself personally took that as a first Make in India example uh, when he talked about it. Uh, also, some of the decisions that are viewed by investors as a reactive decision include the Defense Ministry withdrawal of tenders on short-range surface-to-air missile. Well, clearly, uh, this was not just one isolated step alongside the banning of 101 items was a release of the positive indigenization list of 108 items of defense equipment which comprises of complex systems, sensors, simulators. Now, what are the uh, perspectives on budget 2020 as I see it, where India stands in so far as its regulatory policies concerned and controls on import is concerned? The long-term investment clearly, as the earlier speakers remark, is requires humongous research and development, which means CapEx is very important. A case in point is the observation that was made by the controller and auditor general in terms of identifying how costly it is to manufacture indigenously licensed built platforms, particularly when you talk about fighters, light utility helicopters, even the main battle trunks. This observation is particularly important because it sheds light on the importance of capital expenditure. So commitment to reduce imports simultaneously with a view to promote the make in India seems to be the mantra. Opening up of the defense R&D industry, startups, and for the academia is, in my view, a very good step. 25% of the defense R&D budget has now been earmarked for R&D industry, starts up in academia. And this indeed is a laudable view. Some of the other budget announcements, particularly on infrastructure and improvement in logistics, is in my view going to impact uh, the fortunes of the defense industry. For example, uh, Parvat Mala, which is the border village development, which entails the improvement in roads, railways, and logistics, undoubtedly will improve mobilization and logistics capability. Another important announcement that was made in the budget was the Drone Shakti program. The finance minister specifically emphasized in her speech the importance of private industry, which would be encouraged to take up design and development of military platforms and equipments in collaboration with the DRDO. Now, the objective to attain self-reliance is laudable, but it comes with several caveats associated to it. Uh, here are some of the recommendations that we feel will help strengthen the budget. One is the 
public private partnership the public private partnership in the past has worked very well if you look at some of the initiative embarked upon by select indian companies like tata power strategic engineering division and lnt in association with drdo but we certainly need much more some of the other initiatives by the private sector in the ppp sector uh, are on the advanced stored artillery gun system wherein kalyani group and tata power are playing very very important roles some of the policy considerations that we would suggest to the government include most importantly financing of defense sectors what are some of the international experiences defense bonds are becoming very popular eu raised it some of the relook at some of the typical revenue stream for example a fee based arrangement or annual grants or monthly grants or subsidies taxes and charges on service provision such as construction and maintenance could be a very important source and it may well be shifted to a public private partnership when it comes to looking at the revenue model and therefore the tax policy design assumes significance first in terms of integrating the public private partnership in the existing structure and second providing a special regime for public part, part, uh, partnership with a view to uh, an, an advantage treatment which currently only the defense or the defense arms get budget 2022 has some relevant uh, proposals one is the extension of the concessional 15% tax rate from march 2023 to march 2024 we believe that this should be extended for defense manufacturing uh, other tax incentives would mean the weighted deduction on research and development which will encourage indian company to spend more up until 2021 this weighted deduction was between 150 to 200% it was brought down to 100% the government should review this in the light of r&d that's required for the defense sector the uh, uh, the pli scheme which has been expanded only for drones we do not see any reason why it should not be expanded for other defense manufacturing particularly given the success that india has achieved in the automobiles and the pharmaceutical sector gst and customs tariff are a very important source of looking at promoting the defense industry this will include exemptions for imports of strategic and critical components for indigenously manufactured defense platforms not just available to the defense and to the likes of drdo but also to the public sector undertakings and the private enterprises who are participating in the public public private partnership the drdo in the past has been a firewall in development of cutting edge technology however drdo's recent changes on patents and relevant intellectual publications being available to the domestic industry is free of cost and those initiatives need to be taken forward the other laudable initiatives are the drdo's ability to collaborate with over 250 academic institutes in the defense area in conclusion the defense has had some misses as well one of the things that the industry was expecting was the announcement of a detailed non lapsable modernization fund for defense and internal security this was a very important part of the recommendation that was made by the 15th finance commission and we have seen this non lapsable fund being as an avenue for funding defense budgets overseas as well this certainly in our view will help bridge gap between projected budgetary requirements and allocations for the defense industry this will also in our view fund essentially specific areas where incremental funding is required very often at funds from the consolidated funds of india are accessed one could also look at and this is politically sensitive divestment or public float in select defense public sector undertakings to be able to help mobilize funds which are dedicated only for the defense industry 
So I would just uh, stop over here uh, when the time allocated and look forward to questions if any that are coming if we have the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mukherjee. You covered a lot of ground and you spoke about uh, foreign investment, the uh, journey that it took over a period of time. You talked about innovation, you talked about defense R&D, you talked about PLI, productive uh, linked uh, incentives, etc., uh, Gati Shakti, etc., uh, non-lapsable defense fund, which we have been asking for many years because every year 25-30% uh, of the budget is uh, surrendered simply because of the complex procedures. You simply can't use it and it just goes away. In fact, that is one way the government takes one hand and takes two hands and takes two hands. In fact, that has always been the case this year. But for the last 20 years, uh, it shows uh, it helps the finance minister show that he, he, he or she cares for the defense. But uh, what money actually spent is much, much lesser than the money. Anyway, fully because of lack of time, I will not uh, comment on other issues, but uh, definitely what you said was very interesting. I now the next speaker uh, that is, uh, we have a service personnel uh, who later is not an innovator, Amanda Suchit Chair, He's an innovator, entrepreneur. Ex program director of innovations for defense excellence. I repeat the word innovation for defense excellence because traditionally the defense has been very traditional in their thinking, also. You know, uh, so you definitely require innovative solutions because budget is not going to increase the way you want it to increase. You have to utilize the present budget properly and do some innovative things by which I suppose uh, you can uh, improve the quality of your defense. Uh, he's got a, a 25 years experience with the Navy as a commander. He got a lot of management qualifications. His technical qualifications include MTech in uh, IIT Delhi, BTech in naval architecture and shipbuilding. Uh, he's got uh, a, a more than his share of medals and commendations from the Navy. Uh, and his core competence uh, has been startups, innovations, teamwork, consulting, market research, information technology, strategy government advisory, communication and network. I wonder what is left out. I mean, he's a really qualified person to talk about all these issues. And I'll only touch upon, in fact, just for information, the fact of the speaker is really outstanding and the program is being broadcast live on the YouTube. So this might have also been put on the YouTube also so that anybody, whatever I left out, so not doing justice to the speakers who to speak, also available on the YouTube. Please have a look at that. However, I will support the award that is called uh, uh, one award in the trophy uh, started by Amazon Media. He was top in the 267 in the CII Start, uh, Starter Premier's Awards of 2018. He's been covered in Young Story Com. He's been covered in Digit Magazine. He's been covered in US Magazine. Um, I mean, there, there are a lot of outstanding uh, sort of uh, outstanding achievements to his credit. Now, before, uh, without spending any further time, I will now request Commander Suchit Jain to talk about innovations and entrepreneurship and all other things about the industry. Over to you, Commander Suchit Jain. Uh, thank you, sir, for speaking such kind words about me. I thank the organizers for inviting me on this uh, prestigious forum and my gratitude and regards to all the dignitaries on the dais. So it has been a great uh, uh, hearing and uh, learning from you all. It, and most of the topics have already been covered by the previous speakers. So uh, I, my, I, my focus will be primarily on the innovation side, where I will be talking about uh, the innovation, entrepreneurship, and startups in the uh, defense sector. So this will be my primary area. Uh, to begin with, because uh, whenever I was in the uh, defense, I learned that you should lead with example. And I have uh, lived all my life uh, leading with examples. So it is not that I became an innovator after leaving the defense. I have been an innovator while within the defense itself. So um, I have been a naval architect uh, from Cochin University. And uh, you know, when I joined the service, uh, I was really brightly looking forward to uh, uh, the aircraft carrier being coming up uh, for the Navy. And uh, I lucky I was lucky that I got a chance to be a work on the design of uh, such an aircraft carrier. And when I got a chance, uh, I put all my efforts to uh, see it, that we are able to design it indigenously. And I had my contributions in designing the structure of our aircraft carrier, which is called Vikram. So I did over 1,000 analysis, structural analysis for that uh, vessel. And uh, I'm happy that after 20 years, now the vessel is uh, floating and uh, it has already completed its uh, trials. 
so similarly i was part of other uh, design projects like p70 nerfa which was follow on of the stealth frigates so uh, <clears throat> i did the complete ga modernization of the 17 alpha and i was also part of the nuclear submarine project <clears throat> where uh, i was uh, looking into the planning as well as the structural aspects so uh, after quitting that uh, i i thought that uh, being a defense officer and uh, being in the government uh, service uh, so i have gained enough experience where i can contribute more to the defense uh, while from the outside and i did my uh, post graduation uh, from ahmedabad as well uh, for uh, learning how the business goes on and uh, when i realized that uh, the business aspects are completely different from what i have been brought up uh, while being in the defense because uh, i was uh, uh, even though it was a very harsh life but uh, more or less from the financial side we were never really had to really worry because uh, the uh, resources which were needed to fight the war were all available so uh, now uh, here after coming out we have to even look for the resources to develop and then uh, that's how my entrepreneurship journey started so uh, when i started uh, we uh, shortly became uh, like uh, successful there also uh, within the very first year we were the positive cash flow company and uh, we have been growing uh, every year we were uh, doubling our uh, you know uh, revenues uh, for the consecutive years so uh, i started as a consulting company then became a services company and now we are a products company so uh, during the covid times uh, the times were difficult where i had to uh, scale down my operations uh, substantially and uh, nothing uh, you know uh, was moving very positive in those times so i thought with my experience from the defense and <clears throat> from my entrepreneurship let me contribute to the startup ecosystem in the defense area and that when i worked as program director with uh, idex uh, which is the innovations for defense excellence where i got an opportunity to associate with the, some of the leading startups in the country and i was quite surprised such a deep talent is already existing in the country and if that uh, that talent is nurtured it, it is supported and uh, we can really make big waves and uh, as a lot of speakers have mentioned and emphasized about the ip protection the patents these are very very key critical areas for any technology to uh, to grow because that's where the uh, intellectual property lies and uh, that's where you can build uh, you can uh, commercially tap it as well as take it to the markets so in the defense area uh, as everyone knows that uh, there is a lot of government push on the on the atmanirbharta for the self for sustenance self indigenization so these are the very very important uh, aspects and the focus areas so i remember when i had come out in, somewhere in 2016 i was invited by economic times uh, to a uh, to a round table uh, with the minister uh, that time uh, jain sinha so honorable minister had asked one question uh, so we are launching that startup program so how do you think that uh, you know we can include startups in the government sector so i i rose up and i spoke about it i said there are two criteria uh, one is the financial criteria another one is the technical criteria so these are the eligibility criteria which any any company has to go through and if the criteria itself says uh, you should have prior experience of so many years and should have done turnover of so many years uh, so how can a startup prove that so this is a one obstacle which needs to overcome and then there is a financial criteria uh, which is there <clears throat> so all these are they, they have to deposit the emds so these are the things which startups and the msmes uh, find very difficult to work on so uh, i think minister noted the point and i realized that uh, immediately within few months there was a letter uh, from the government which said that uh, such a criteria for the startups has been waived off so i see that uh, there is lot of lot of uh, uh, push by the ruling party for making the things viable for the enterprise Uh, but uh, we have been you know living in a country which has been uh, you know a uh, 70 years we have been into a different thought where enterprise has been looked at not very positively enterprise uh, there has been a trust deficit with the entrepreneurs so that that is what uh, needs to be overcome and it is being overcome slowly but uh, i would uh, really want that process uh, to hasten up uh, so that the uh, the policy changes that are deep level changes that are happening already Uh, in the defense area that can really go down and uh, give the fruits and the value that we are really looking at so even in this budget which has come out you know, for uh, 2022 there have been some landmark changes uh, that uh, you know uh, even for that <coughs> capex uh, spending 
uh, has been increased to 68% from the 58% last year. So that is a huge amount. The CapEx budget itself is uh, 1.5 lakh crores. And uh, uh, 68%, that means 1 lakh crore is available for the domestic industry. So that is a huge opportunity for our MSME, for our industry, defense industry, to tap it and uh, take our uh, uh, defense manufacturing uh, to the next level. Uh, and to top it, uh, without the R&D, you can actually uh, not really uh, make uh, innovations and uh, make the future uh, equipment and the platforms. So that R&D budget, uh, including uh, the private sector, up to 25% of the DRDO budget is the amazing step that has happened. There are many more steps. I would like uh, the young people who are already sitting and watching this program to be aware that the government is really opened up in earlier times, you know, it used to take uh, nothing less than 10 to 20 years before a product can be out. That that cycle has been greatly shortened by various government programs today. IDEX has been one of the programs which not only uh, supports, uh, identifies such uh, startups, it also gives them the funding up to 1.5 crores. So uh, during my uh, presence in this organization, uh, we a uh, lot of I saw a lot of startups getting selected and getting benefited from this program where the equipment development time has been shortened. Uh, had the corona not been there, I'm sure a lot of them would have produced the uh, equipment within two years as was uh, slated in the program. So uh, if not two years, two and a half years, three years, we are seeing many of the startups, they've already produced uh, those equipment and uh, they're very good equipment. Uh, so uh, the, uh, they, they, because the startups are coming uh, from <clears throat> various academic background from their own innovations, but uh, the, when the equipment has to perform for the military, it has to really perform in the harsh environments. So whether it is the battleground, whether it is the sea, whether it is the air, this is a very, very harsh environment and its requirements are far greater than any other equipment which is, uh, which is uh, there in, in the, in the mm, civilian market. So that's where uh, that uh, the startups need nurturing. They need support. They need guidance uh, from the uh, from the stalwarts who have been there in the uh, in the armed forces, and they come out and support them. So we have been doing that, and we uh, if that is done, I'm sure uh, that uh, you know a lot of startups will produce military grade equipment within the country. So uh, these are the kind of uh, uh, things uh, that we are looking at, and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, many other, uh, you know, opportunities like the government has already earmarked uh, 500 crores uh, for the startups uh, from uh, IDEX itself. And uh, there, there there has been a procurement of uh, 1,000 crores earmarked for, uh, from these IDEX startups only. So this is a huge benefit being given. So earlier, if you remember that in the defense industry, uh, the in industry invests a lot. They, they keep on investing for years, for 10 years, 20 years before they see the fruits of their results. So, but uh, not the case anymore. Now, uh, once uh, once a product is ready, it is ready for uh, deployment with the armed forces, and it is being taken. So, I saw many such cases when some leading technologies, some uh, anti-drone uh, countermeasures equipment, which is being uh, you know uh, procured uh, by Air Force, and uh, some <clears throat> live boys being procured, uh, uh, robotic live boys being procured by the Indian Navy, and uh, the Army is going ahead and procuring many such equipment, uh, like. A see through armor and uh, many other uh, critical equipment there, you know, which are being produced by the startups, not the MNCs. So, a huge opportunity today, I would say, has opened up for the for the industry, for the startups and the MSME to participate uh, to participate in the defense in a big way. And uh, if we are able to create an ecosystem for them uh, by uh, bringing all the stakeholders uh, together and uh, support it. Uh, then I'm sure uh, there is no reason why the Atam Nirbharta in defense cannot be achieved. And uh, as uh, 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 Chairman uh, Ajit Ranadeji mentioned that we should also focus on the exports. So export is a key area. So unless unless uh, we, uh, we, uh, we also open up the market and uh, take it to uh, out, uh, offshore, uh, then uh, they will not become sustainable. So to make them sustainable, uh, we also have to look at the domestic market as well as the uh, market abroad. So a lot of promotion is happening today uh, to such technologies that can be taken abroad. And IP protection is a key plays a key role in this. So uh, I would urge all those innovators who are uh, looking forward to work with defense or any other area to please protect your technology, to protect your uh, 
uh, to protect your uh, uh, devices uh, through the IP protection. There are many such mechanisms available. Be aware about, about them. There could be a separate program about it that could be covered where uh, this IP protection can be done. So uh, also there are other opportunities to participate with the government where the government has mandated 20% of their procurement uh, from the MSMEs and the startups. And uh, as I already mentioned that the startups uh, do not have to uh, have the prior experience or they do not have to have uh, some amount of turnover or they don't have to even submit the EMD. So, uh, and they can directly go to the gym today where they can display their product on the startup runway and they can be uh, you know, procured by the, uh, the concerned uh, ministries, departments of the government and the armed forces. So uh, this is, I think, a uh, huge uh, times have really changed. And now it is for us to tap that opportunity. And uh, I'm available uh, for any, any uh, guidance, any support which uh, is required. And I would really urge, because now what has happened that even the military platforms, such as warships, uh, aircrafts, the tanks, uh, we, uh, we need not depend on the foreign shores. We can do them all within our own country. There has been uh, opinion seeking poll uh, by the FICI where I also said that we, we it can be done within the country and we can do it. So as uh, Brigadier Hemant mentioned that uh, Army has taken a step uh, to identify such talent within the armed forces who have been working on these areas and we can uh, make a pool of such officers and uh, such uh, men who can, who can contribute towards the development and we can go to the government and tell them like, look, this can be done all in-house. We need not really depend on the of, uh, foreign countries for such a help. So uh, uh, those areas also can be done and government has created a right uh, platform for it. So uh, with this, I will like to conclude my uh, uh, discussion on this and I'll be open to any questions uh, coming up. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Commander Suchin Jain. Uh, you covered a lot of ground. You talked about innovations. You talked about Atmanirbharta. Uh, of course, when you talk of Atmanirbharta, we also have to ensure that Atmanirbhar products are of the same class, if not higher, as uh, uh, as uh, compared to the uh, ones that were imported earlier. And many a times, that is not the case. You know, aircraft which was built up in uh, HAL aircraft which came directly from Russia, there was a hell of a lot of difference in absorption of technology. I don't want to get into it because uh, Air Marshal is there and I'm sure he would uh, he can talk about it. Of course, there have been some successful examples also of Larson and Tobro, whose technology has been of a good class and the Navy has been happy with the submarines. The uh, Indian Coast Guard has been happy with the kind of offshore petrol vessels that they have given. So, uh, But I think quality has to be ensured. And uh, you talked about startups, how the startups are uh, coming up in a big way. And one of the examples of the startups was, was this uh, uh, building the retreat ceremony that took place in which Thousand drones were flown, and this was done by the IIT, uh, one of the IITs. And I think we are the fourth uh, uh, country in the world where such a large number of, uh, let's say, drones came up and performed so many maneuvers, which uh, we all of us saw on the screen. Uh, purely because of your short of time, I will now uh, look at the question and answer session. Uh, I, I had requested the organizers, Vinayji. Any questions? Uh, that I hardly see any questions uh, uh, on the in the chat box. There's only one comment, uh, which is, uh, of course, by the uh, by uh, Ajit Ranadeji. I'll just read out for the sake of uh, everybody. Uh, he's written that US defense and space spending, especially on research, has a positive impact on its economy. And some of the technologies developed by defense and space uh, have become an integral part of their daily life. Because most of the industry that started off in the Western world has a background of the defense uh, uh, industry uh, started off from defense industry in the second world war first world war all those innovations that came up actually started the industrial revolution in europe or your, your uh, of course recommendation is immensely sensible no i am the last person to uh, comment on it yeah uh, yeah i can see dr dikai has asked a question uh, okay he just put a comment he said the shift of theater commands has brought in new push to the expenditure. Well, I'll put it this way. Uh, I mean, I'm one person who was really sad when General Rawat passed away because Chief of Defense Staff had an immense role in coordinating the budgetary aspects. And I only hope uh, that the next PDS takes over fast so that, uh, you know, the budgeting of the three services vis-a-vis -vis relative importance, etc. can be coordinated better. Uh, yes, uh, Chief of Defense Staff has a very important role to play. 
Theatre command is one aspect. Uh, I, I still wonder if Nitin Gokhale is uh, uh, around or not. But uh, while in, uh, talking to Nitin Gokhale, uh, the chief, uh, the, the GOC and C of the Army Training Command talked about the cyber command, which has to come in a much faster time frame because the threat is immediate. Threat is immediate. Uh, okay, uh, I can see some more question uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Likai. He says, is the defense budget related to threat perception? I will leave it at that. Uh, 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 General um, uh, Malik had said in 99 war, we will fight with what we have and we will fight well. So the, as far as threat perception is concerned, uh, we'll cover it up in a better manner uh, with uh, when uh, uh, General Shekatka starts talking. So I take it uh, that we are now short of time and uh, we are already at 11.30. So all that remains for me to do is uh, thank all the speakers, uh, Dr. Ajit Ralade, uh, then uh, Commander Suchi Jain, uh, uh, Admiral, uh, sorry, Admiral, uh, my course is also Anil Chopra, he's a Vice Admiral, but uh, Air Marshal Anil Chopra and Shri Mukesh Bhutaneji for an excellent presentation of various aspects of the defense budget. Uh, we have learned a lot from you. And uh, now I request uh, uh, Lieutenant General Shekatkar uh, for his uh, concluding remarks. Uh, he doesn't require an introduction because he's firstly a chairman uh, of the institution where this, uh, where this seminar is taking place. And secondly, General Shekatkar Committee will ensure that he remains in limelight because every second day, third day, there is some mention of something happening or not happening. And as I mentioned to you right in the beginning, that government has accepted one more of his recommendation of reducing 9,000 personnel from the NES. I repeat, 9,000 personnel. A very, very positive step. I wish they work faster on the General Shekatkar Committee. Over to General Shekatkar for your concluding remarks, sir. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Brigadier Mahajan. With your permission and with the permission of the galaxy of people, Dr. Ranade, the Air Marshal, the Bhutani, Commander Jain, and everybody, with your permission, I'll skip speaking on the allocation of defense budget for this year. That has been spoken about, it's been analyzed. But I would make a few comments. I know some of you may not agree with that. Like the government did not agree with the Security Committee report. They say, what are you talking about? You see, you try and implement it and then you will see. And just now, Brigadier Mahajan mentioned, yesterday the Honorable Raksha Mantri has signed 9,400 engineers are not required in the military engineering service. And I'm sharing with you in confidence. Under my own signature, I've written there, MES, which is supposed to be engineering services. It is known as money eating services. Money eating services. So money is never enough for any defense anywhere in the world. There is no country in the world whose chief of the defense forces is happy with the budget allocation. There is no country in the world, I have done this entire exercise, who do not want more forces, including the United States and China. Even today, they are asking for more forces. But my philosophy is, or my recommendation is, and I am a firm believer that obesity of number does not renew the war. Obesity of numbers does not renew the war. To win the war, you have to have a slim, trim, agile, and fast-moving body of the troops. If you don't have, you can have 15 lakhs X, Y, Z. You can go to war, but you may not win the war. So that is the first mindset which is being changed around. We have put a recommendation which has been improved that whatever was the strength of the Indian Army or armed forces, barring Navy, and some technology otherwise, on 1st of January 2017, not a soldier to be increased, not one soldier to be increased. You have to do modification, you have to do readjustment within the same ceiling limit. And that is impacted. For example, the 9,700 or 400 engineers being reduced. They will be adjusted somewhere else that is required. Second one, 
the mention has been made the urgent requirement of cyber command space command and special forces these three are the elements which are going to help us to win the war including our drone technology and so on and so forth earlier it was said that the war has to be fought on the sea on the land and in the sky today the war has to be fought in future the war will be fought from the base of the ocean the commander will know it better from the oceanic bay to land to the sky and to the space anyone who dominate the space will dominate the world and therefore space command will have to come up with priority space is also connected to cyber cyber does not win on land lines it is a different mechanism altogether so these are the issues which are now drawing the attention of the government other thing is that we are also looking at the shape and size of the some of the organizations the drdo the ordnance factory board the dgq and all the quality assurance and so on and so forth they are the biggest money i will not say gadlers but spenders of this money when you see the outcome which comes the galaxy of people in the seminar i am asking one question to you do you need a ordnance factory today to make your uniforms to make our clothes socks net mosquito and so on and so forth it's a high time so we have looked at 14 ordnance factories which can be closed down tomorrow and the we war will we will not lose the war this can be transferred this production can be transferred to the private companies they will do it another recommendation is that do not give the land do not sell the land of the ordnance factories but can you give the administration system of those ordnance factories which are not in the high tech areas to the private participants they will run you can give it to the jam you can give it to anybody who are producing clothes you can give it to there are number of private peoples do you need an ordnance factory to prepare the spare parts for a truck or for a vehicle we are the vehicle producers they said you give us the place we will take you anywhere as you want anywhere we want similarly i don't think in time to come that the requirement of a service known as military engineering services and therefore it is quite likely that by 2035 there will be nothing known as mes not required if the road can be constructed in the mountainous area today without mes why can't we do it along the border of pakistan why can't we do it it can be done there are people doing it the sagar mala project is going the parvat mala projects are going is there a mes there far from 2018 till december 2021 22000 crore rupees have been saved because of these harsh measures and by 2025 or 2026 we will be able to save 57000 crore without losing a war and that is why you find this concept of atmanirbhar bharat स्वावलंबी भारत सक्षम भारत सकुशल भारत हाउ कैन यू बी आत्मनिर्भर इफ यू कंटिन्यू टू इम्पोर्ट योर इक्विपमेंट फ्रॉम आउटसाइड एंड टू आर हॉर वी फाउंड देर इज ए वेल ऑर्गेनाइज वेरी वेल स्ट्रक्चर्ड नेक्सस बॉडी नेक्सस बिटवीन दो वर्स एंड आई डोट वॉन्ट टू नेम सम पीपल आर सम ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इट विल बी रॉन्ग फॉर मी to make money out of that so this nexus has to be broken totally and that is why you find 200 items being brought under the list of indigenization number of things have been changed it is the reason the second aspect in this is when you 
want to export your equipment, weapon technology, which is part of defense, the importing country or the country who want to buy would ask you, are you using this equipment in your own country? And the answer is no. Then he said, then why should I be buy from you? Sir, let me tell you, even the CRPF, the border security force and so on, they ask you the question, are you using this particular weapon in your own organization? If they say no, they say, that's why they are going to America. That is why they are going to other countries to buy the system. So as Mr. Bhutani was bringing out, I think there is a need for us to insist to use the equipment, weapon system, technology of our own country and encourage the private sector. A mention has been made about Lepsiba fund. There was again a nexus between the so-called financial experts. If you have got 500 crores, the 200 crores will be lapsed. They will be taken next year. So in actual fact, you will get only 300 crore, though they will call it 500 crore. <coughs> and that is why we have to recommend these funds should not be lapsed. They should be carried forward. Roll on plan. Another recommendation has been there that the 2.37 to 3.2 percent of the GDP budget should be allocated for defense. The reason being the modern technology like drones, spacecrafts, a missile system are costing us more. And therefore, when you export the item, <clears throat> you earn the foreign exchange. And when you earn the foreign exchange, your cost of procurement goes down. That is why just last month we have signed an agreement between the Philippines to export BrahMos missile. The next on card are number of East Asian countries. There are some strategic reasons also why we are boosting up that sector with these BrahMos missiles. Our next priority is going to be Middle East, maybe North Africa, because these are the zone of conflicts in years to come. And if Indian mechanisms start working, it makes the task easier for us. Last two points, I would request you to kindly consider. There is a need to indigenize the minds of the officers also, the minds of the experts. In any seminar, unless you quote Russia, unless you quote USA, unless you quote France, unless you quote a nation which does not exist on this planet, you are not taken to be an expert. Why can't we generate our own indigenization minds? So first the minds have to be indigenized. Only then, just to give you an example, before Kargil war, I was posted in the army headquarters. And during one of the discussion, the honorable finance minister told my chief, he said, generally you reduce one person from the army and I'll give you so much of money. So when we came out, he asked me, Datta, I was a major general then, and my chief, what is the strength we can reduce without affecting our combat potential? I just said one and a half lakh. Thank God he was in uniform, I was in uniform, otherwise he would have bagged me, he would have slapped me there only in front of everybody. He said, what are you talking bloody nonsense? I have been told that you reduce one, sir. I said, easily, sir, one and a half lakh. The study was done. And we were able to reduce 50,000 people in a study of three months. Of course, we did not reduce. We call it suspended animation. Means you keep the strength down. And when required, you take them. And then I came out of the army headquarters. I was posted out. Kargil war came. After Kargil war, we added another one and a half lakh. Musharraf did not attack India because they reduced 50,000 people. Why I'm giving you this, that we have to look into all these aspects now. Only then the defense budget will be sufficient for us. And as I mentioned, there is no commander anywhere in the world who is happy with the defense budget. There is no commander anywhere in the world who is happy with the strength. But we in India are learning. Our God bless his soul, CDS has tried our best. Our three chiefs are trying their level best. The aim is not to reduce just for sake of reducing it. 
No, it is not. It is to make sure that whatever allocation is being given to us, we utilize in the right time. To that extent, I must compliment and congratulate the Bosla School and the organization for organizing this webinar. We are grateful to you all, sir, who came and spent your time, our young generation also listening. And I request people like Dr. Rande and their marshal, Mr. Bhutani and Dr. Chen, because you are heard outside. Your views are taken without sounding critical. They should not say, oh, he's talking against the army. That is unfortunate truth today. The moment you speak something, they say, oh, he's against the army. Why should Dr. Rade be against the army? Why should the air marshal be against the army or the armed forces? So, but when we put it across to things, people will start accepting. I only hope the bureaucrats are not listening to it because then they will get the clue. And next year, our budget will be cut furthermore. So they need to be told in that way. Not that they are bad. They know they have to survive in this very organization. They know they have to live in this very country. Everybody is not going abroad. So it will be wrong to blame the bureaucrats. Sir, having worked with these committees and committees and committees, it is not the bureaucrats. It is the bureaucracy which makes all the impact, which makes all the effect. So once again, I thank you all, grateful to you, and very kind of you. Hope to meet you sometime and listen to your views in future. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Janu Shekatkar, sir. I was very happy to know these figures came out for the first time that because of Shekatkar committee report, we have been able to reduce 22,000 crores from our revenue budget. And you have also mentioned that 57,000 crores is what is expected to be reduced by the year 2025. So. The government is moving slowly, but it is definitely moving in the right direction. Let us hope that the speed increases in the days to come. And a second aspect that I would talk to you uh, would want to highlight is about this monetization of assets. You recommended that instead of selling land of the ordnance factories, it can be given to the corporate world for you know producing something there. In fact, today only there's an article they said a lot of land armed forces have. Why can't you have solar parks on that land and generate solar power from there? There are a lot of innovative ideas by which I suppose your budget uh, allotment can be increased. Uh, purely because of lack of time, I'll stop here and I'll hand over the mic now to Shri Vinay Kulkarni. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you very much all the dignitaries who spoke. And it was an extremely enlightening uh, discussion, uh, not only for us here, but also for the students at large. And I'm sure it will be followed on uh, many platforms uh, from days to come. Uh, with this, I hand over the, the um, uh, mic to uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Snehal Nikum, Assistant Professor in the Defense Department, uh, for the vote of thanks. Over to you, Snehal. Thank you, sir. A very warm and graceful afternoon to everyone present virtually. It is my privilege to propose a vote of thanks speech on the occasion of 158th birth anniversary of Dr. B.S. Munje and acknowledge the contribution of those who worked really hard to make this event a grand success. So on behalf of Central Hindu Military Education Society's Bosla Military College and Kanuji Amiri Maritime Research Institute, I take this opportunity to thank our author, Mr. Akshay Jog and Mr. Nitin Gokhale for the release of the book. Today, we had an opportunity to hear your thoughts and this will surely be going to encourage us in our future event. I'm immensely thankful to Lieutenant General Dibish Gadkar, decorated with PVSM, AVSM, BSM, President of CHME Society, to be a part of this inaugural function and giving a presidential address. So, your thoughts have enlightened our minds. My heartful thanks are due to all speakers, including Dr. Ajit Ranari, VC of Gokhale Education Society, Gokhale Education Institute of Economics and Politics. Air Marshal Anil Chopra, decorated with PVSM, AVSM, BM, BSM, DG of Central for Air Power Studies, then CA Advocate Mukesh Bhutani, founder and managing partner of BMR Legal Advocates, a boutique law firm, then Kamado Sachin Jain, SSM, who is an innovative entrepreneur and ex program director, Innovations for Defense Excellence for sharing their opinion and sparing valuable time for the busy, from their busy schedule to grace the occasion. I, I need to mention my deepest 
sense of appreciation to our chairman of this function, Brigadier Hemant Mahajan, YSM, for showing his enormous cooperation. I must not be forgetful to thank the Department of Civics and Politics Center for Excellence in Maritime Studies, Mumbai University, for the collaboration with Kamri. I also extend my special thanks to our General Secretary, Dr. D.G. Belgavar, sir, our Secretary, CMA, Hemant Deshpande, sir, our working president, Shri P.G. Kulkarni, sir, and Director of Kamri, Captain Dr. S.G. Naraunia, sir, and all the other official members of CHME Society for being the catalyst that stimulated us to do our best and standing as a pillar of strength. I'm also thankful to our proactive and dedicated staff and technical support members of our institution for their involvement and their willingness to take on the completion of the task beyond their comfort zone. And lastly, my sincere gratitude goes to all the viewers who are present virtually for their interest. Once again, thank you so much for attending this event. Jai Hind. Jai.